I'm going to be reading from a magazine, a Jewish magazine called L'Chaim. Each week, a new publication, including various inspirational materials. I'll be reading a story and a couple, uh, a few little Torah comments, and then also one little item, which I'll start with now. It's called Mashiach Matters. Why did the children of Israel rush when they finally left Egypt? Didn't their extreme haste give the mistaken impression they had to leave quickly? Parah wanted them to leave at that point. They could have left at a leisurely pace. But the Jews leaving Egypt was not a mere geographical move. It was a step away from the world of spiritual degradation they had become accustomed to in Egypt. When a person desires to sever his connection to evil, it must be done all at once, not gradually. A person must grab the first opportunity that presents itself to escape from a negative influence. However, when Mashiach comes, it will not be so hard. we will not be so hard-pressed to leave the exile immediately. God's promise to remove all impurity from the world, so there will not be any reason to run away from evil. This is a story. After experiencing the horrors of the Holocaust by the kindness of God, I arrived in the land of Israel in 1945. Now, this is a true story because it's under this section called It Happened Once, and it gives some details about the writer who wrote the story. At a certain point, okay, so uh, I'll start again. After experiencing the horrors of the Holocaust by the kindness of God, I arrived in the land of Israel in 1945. I soon joined Kibbutz Yafna, where I managed to combine farm work and guard duty with Torah study. At a certain point, I was approached by the Jewish Agency's Department of Torah Education with an offer to serve as the head of a yeshiva in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Initially, I balked at the idea of leaving Israel, but I consulted a few rabbis who advised me to accept. My wife and I reached the shores of Brazil in 1954, but when I asked the locals who came to greet us about the location of the yeshiva, they were perplexed. The yeshiva in Rio, what are you talking about? It seemed there had been a miscommunication and institutions devoted to full-time Torah study did not yet exist in Brazil. I hardly sent word back to the Jewish agency only to receive their reply. Since you're already here, try to do what you can for the community for the agreed upon two years. One day, my wife and I went for a walk. As we conversed in Hebrew, a local Jewish boy overheard and took interest in us. He became the founding member of a Hebrew study group that eventually led to the opening of the Bar, of the Bar Ilan School. After three years in Rio, we had some 600 students. In 1959, back in Israel, I became the administrator of a, for, of a farm for training young immigrants in the agricultural settlement, settlement of Shafir. While there, I got in trouble for teaching Torah subjects to the students. Concerned, the head of the local council suggested I read out, reached out to a certain Sadiq, a righteous man in New York, who could be consulted on such matters. After writing to this Sadiq, there was the law of Jirabba, I received a letter back from him, advising me that if I kept on teaching in a peaceful and pleasant manner, nobody would bother me. That communication turned out to be the first of many. My connection with the Rabbi and Chabad grew strong over the following years. In 1963, it even cost me my job at a different institution. Some people didn't approve of my co connection to a Hasidic sect like Chabad. But just when that happened, I got a phone call from the Jewish agency. They wanted me to come back to Bar Ilan in Rio de Janeiro. In the six years since we left, the school's spiritual state had declined dramatically. Although it was a religious school, it was as if all the school's educational achievements were undone. Without a real yeshiva, I realized it would be difficult to effect any lasting change. And so in 1966, Yeshiva Machana Israel was founded in Petropolis, an old town in the mountains near Rio that had once been a holiday spot for Brazilian monarchy. With 20 students from across the country, that same year I traveled to the Rebbe for the first time and participated in a public farbringen. I was seated at the main days, and when, I don't know what that word is, days, and when the Rebbe called on any shlachim or emissaries who were present to say he turned to me with a big smile and said, you are also a shliach. Our mission to Brazil on behalf of the Jewish agency ended that year later, but... The Rebbe instructed me to stay on for at least until the yeshiva is secure. I went right back. At first, my wife and younger son came along too, while our older daughter stayed in Israel. But this proved difficult for my wife, so she went back. While I stayed on with the students, I finally returned to Israel two years after that. A few years passed, there was another phone call, this time from the community in Brazil. 
Are you just going to let the yeshiva fall apart? They also reached out to the rabbi, told me I should consult my friends to make a decision. I turned to some respected Hasidim in Israel, and they all thought that I should go back. Before making the tri our third trip to Brazil, we went to the Rebbe. A few years passed and there was another, uh, sorry, before making our third trip to Brazil, we went to the Rebbe. Nobody thought that you would have to go back, he conceded, but it seems that there is still more work left for you to do there. The yeshiva continued to grow and the students even began studying the teachings of Hasidus and engaging in Jewish outreach across the country. The need for a parallel institution for girls soon became apparent. The rabbi stipulated the two schools should be in two different cities so that Machana Israel Seminary was founded in the nearby Teresopolis. My wife ran the seminary and she spent all week there with the students. It was hard work, but we are proud to say that we have, there have been at least 50 marriages between the graduates of the two schools. And now, now many of those families are sending their own children to study there. Along with the success, we faced plenty of opposition in establishing these schools, including from some of the local Jews. And one audience with the rabbi, my wife exclaimed, why is everything so difficult? <laughs> the rabbi replied, since you're fighting assimilations, the forces of negativity are trying to fight back. It's like a candle. Just before a flame goes out, it suddenly starts to sputter and jump. It's not a reason to be dismayed, but to do even more. 1987 was a Hakel year, commemorating, like this year actually, Hakel, assembling year, gathering year, commemorating that once in seven year gathering of the Jewish people during temple times, and I went to New York to participate in the first international conference of Shluchim. At one point, while distributing copies of a recently published discourse of his, the Rebbe made a cryptic remark, handing me an extra copy, he said, this is for the 15 years that we haven't seen each other. I was taken aback, hadn't I visited the Rebbe many times over the past 15 years? After searching for an adequate explanation and failed, failing to find one, I decided to ask the rabbi directly. My comment about not seeing each other, he wrote in his reply, follows my recent talks on Hakel. The rabbi explained that although I had visited many times over the past 15 years, two complete Hakel cycles, I had never actually seen him in a Hakel year since becoming a chassid. He wrote that he was pleased I had broken this pattern and a third Hakel hadn't passed without us seeing each other. Over the years, I received 150 letters from the rabbi containing his guidance, but blessings, and encouragement. The rabbis in Brazil, none of whom were from there, used to tell me that hair would grow on the palm of my hand before there would be a yeshiva in Brazil. But thank God we saw the fulfillment of the rabbis' blessings. There isn't any hair on my palms, but there are three yeshiva in Brazil with thousands of graduates, over 40 of whom serve as rabbis and shlachim throughout the country. And this coming up um, week is called Yid Shvat. And uh, if tomorrow's five and then six is Saturday. So anyway, tomorrow's Friday, but I'm recording this video for Friday because um, I want to give myself time to do what I need to do tomorrow. And so, because the Sabbath comes in before five o'clock and it's after midnight, so it's technically tomorrow. So it's the fifth, right? Friday is five and then six is Saturday, Shabbos. And then Sunday is seven, Monday is eight, Tuesday is nine, Wednesday is Yud Shabbat. Tuesday night is going to be the day commemorating the previous rabbis passing and the current, the most recent Lubavitcher Rebbe married, his current wife was the daughter of the Lubavitcher Rebbe that had been the current Rebbe, that Rebbe passed, and then a year later, the Rebbe on that day took over the leadership. So this, uh, it says inside of the Lachai magazine, dedicated to the Rebbe on 73 years of leadership, whose teachings and example are never ending source of life for all mankind, may we continue in his path and complete the mission with which he has charged us to make the world conscious of the imminent redemption and to prepare the environment where this ideal can be realized. And three little pieces it says from the Torah, um, 12, 2, chapter, uh, from Exodus, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, this month shall be to you. According to Rabbi Yitzhak, the Torah should have begun with this verse and not in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. What is so special about the mitzvah commandment and why doesn't the Torah Begin with the words, I am the Lord thy God, a seemingly more fundamental principle of Judaism. The existence of God is the basis upon which the observance of Torah and Mitzvah is predicated. 
But the objective of the entire Torah is best expressed in this of the month. Chodesh shall be to you. The purpose of the Jew is to become an active partner in creation. The word, the Hebrew word Chodesh comes from Chadash, new, transforming the physical world, which seems to be a separate entity divorced from godliness, into yet another expression of holiness. That's from the teachings of the Rebbe. From Nezara Kodesh comments Rashi on the Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. The Lord struck all the firstborn in Egypt. Whenever the Torah states, and the Lord, it refers to God in his heavenly court. When it comes to meeting out punishment, God gives the decision over to the heavenly angels, who do not know the thoughts of man. A Jew is not punished for negative thoughts. As it states, a bad thought is not considered part of deed. By contrast, when it comes to reward, God does not consult with his heavenly court. As a good thought is considered part of deed, and only God knows their thoughts and intentions. And then the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe shares on Exodus chapter 13, verse 14, where the mighty hand God brought us out of Egypt, that God's mighty hand was not was directed not only toward power and the Egyptians, but toward the children of Israel. Some Jews preferred to remain in slavery and were redeemed by God against their will. Likewise, God will redeem us from our present exile with a mighty hand, taking with him even those Jews who might prefer to remain in exile. Wishing you a beautiful Shabbos and uh, luxury and yum and a holy boundary, looking forward to maturing, learning about myself and others and harmony and God's will for us.